Did you know the young boy drowned here? He wasn't a very good swimmer. The counselors weren't paying attention. He should have been watched every minute. You see, he was my son. His name was Jason. And today is his birthday. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Underrated Series. I'm your host, Steve Cravens, and joining me for the very first time is my very good friend and fellow film fanatic, Andres Galago, a.k.a. Galagost. Thank you for joining me today, buddy. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, this is, we, we, we've talked about doing this one for a while. We actually waited until the Halloween season to do it because it's no better time to talk about Friday the 13th, which is our movie today, it is Platinum Dunes 2009 remake of Friday the 13th, which was released on February 13th, 2009. I know you feel the same way as I do. This is one of the most criminally disrespected and underrated slashers of all time. Absolutely. It's it, it kind of really surprises me how how much hate this movie has gotten over the past couple of years, because we, we just found this out right before we started recording is that we were both at the same screening together. We had no idea. We weren't friends at the time. Yeah. From what I remember about that screening, uh, the entire audience was in on it and we all loved it. It was like going to a rock concert. It was so great. It was personally one of my favorite horror movie experiences in theaters ever. It's one of those weird times where it was kind of like, um, it was kind of like 30 minutes or less and the hangover part two, because when I went to go see it in the movie theater, it was like sold out crowds and people were laughing like hysterically, having a great time. And then, you know, you leave and you go onto IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, and people are just shitting on the movie. It's like, well, that didn't equate to the crowd I just saw with. Same case for this movie. The Friday the 13th series is not high art. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, it's one step above, you know, pornography as far as I'm concerned, especially back in the 80s. It's just, it's really like shameless, you know, slasher trash. It is what it is. I mean, even Paramount Pictures was ashamed to put these movies out. They did it because they were cheap and they made a lot of money and they kept the lights on. That yeah. said, they're they're very enjoyable pieces of trash. Uh, and, and honestly, this remake, it's a very, if you're going to call it a piece of trash, fine. You cannot deny that it is very well made. It has great production value. And again, we're not seeing Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight or Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood, but it has decent acting for a slasher movie, especially a remake. Uh, I think there's plenty to enjoy about this movie and plenty to appreciate about this movie. So let's go ahead and kind of move into the nitty gritty of this movie. We already mentioned how we saw this movie at the same screening, even though we weren't uh, friends at the time, we were at the same screening. Mm -hmm. um, does the movie hold up in your opinion? You know, 11 years later, almost 12 years later, which is horrifically depressing. Does it hold up as a slasher? This has been one of those films that has always been in my October horror movie rotation Cons consistently for the past 12 years. So in terms of it aging well, absolutely. I think it's aged the best out of all the, out of all the Friday the 13th films. It's one of those that you look that when you look at um, the first film, even 10 years later, there's certain aspects that even still feel dated back then. Whereas the 2009 Platinum Dooms reboot still feels as fresh as, as it did 12 years ago. It feels like that's a movie that could have been done four, three, even two years ago. Couldn't agree with you more. And I actually think this is the best remake that Platinum Dunes made. I, I, I like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. I saw that opening day two back in 2003. I think it was October 17th, uh, 2003. In which case, I'm looking at the date here. It's October 18th. So, geez, that was 17 years. <laughs> Jesus, God. <laughs> We're getting older, bud. Um, but this is my favorite Platinum Dunes remake. As a matter of fact, I actually had the uh, privilege to have a meeting with uh, Brad Fuller uh, when I first moved out here for about an hour. And we talked about 
the Texas Chainsaw Massacre we talked about Friday the 13th and we talked about Nightmare on Elm Street and he actually he confessed to me as well that Friday the 13th is his personal favorite out of the the big three remakes uh, that they did usually with these retrospectives with this underrated series I like to do a little brief recap of the plot um, I have a feeling if you're watching this video you're very well versed in Friday the 13th in which case you know this plot and if you don't the fuck but I mean again it's campers show up into Jason's territory, get slaughtered, wash, rinse, repeat. There's your plot. And I know what you're thinking. It's like, oh, well, Jared Padalek, he's looking for his sister. Shut the fuck. The plot is Jason is hacking up horny teenagers and people in their 20s. That is the plot. That is why we watch this. We like seeing horny people get killed and killed in vicious, horrible, brutal ways. And this movie delivers. So, it does. It does. It delivers. <laughs> so for those of you uh, who, are, who don't know, Friday the 13th was actually directed by Marcus Nispel, who's a very famous music video director who directed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake for Platinum Dunes. That was his directorial debut. This was actually his third feature after Texas Chainsaw Massacre and after Pathfinder, which was an epic bomb back in 2007. So this movie kind of rejuvenated his career and then put it back in the shitter. Because after, after uh, this movie, he did uh, Conan the Barbarian, remake with uh, Jason Momoa, who wasn't quite Jason Momoa yet, and that movie kind of, you know, just fell into the cocaine grinder that Benicio Del Toro fell in and licensed to kill. Um, and again, this is not only Platinum Dune's best remake, but it's his best movie as far as I'm concerned. This is the first movie he's done where it actually felt like he knew what he was doing. It, it felt like he knew what kind of movie he was trying to make. He knew that this was, you know, it's a, it's a mindless remake of a slasher movie. The whole point of this movie is to have fun and to give the audience what they want, which is brutal kills. Texas Chainsaw Massacre had beautiful cinematography, who, by the way, Daniel Pearl, who uh, was the cinematographer for a lot of his music videos, and he actually shot Pathfinder and Texas Chainsaw Massacre for Marcus Nispel, and he was the cinematographer for Toby Hooper for the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So there's a lot of you know, horror lineage going on with Daniel Pearl shooting this movie for Marcus Nispel, and that actually leads to how gorgeous this movie really is. This is hands down the most gorgeous looking Friday the 13th movie ever made. Oh yeah. It, it goes into the production value that this movie has versus the 80s movies, which were kind of like, you know, very much, you know, you know, put the camera here, shoot it this way. Very stale lighting. There was no, there was no style to it. It was very workmanlike, very, it, it was filmed by hacks. The final chapter had a definitive style to it. It was probably the best directed out of all the previous films. But even still, in comparison to that film, the amount of style that's in play with Daniel Pearl's lighting, his cinematography, and even Nispal's direction in terms of how he even coordinates some of the kills, it's freaking leaps and bounds above some of the original films. I mean, again, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, again, no disrespect to Sean S. Cunningham. Uh, and uh, I mean, Joseph Zito did a great job in the final chapter, but Again, you didn't have the, this production value. You didn't have that that gorgeous cinematography by Daniel Pearl, that very stylish cinematography by Daniel Pearl. Um, and I think that's just another attribute to this movie, why it's worth checking out, why it holds up. is because, again, like you mentioned earlier, it doesn't feel like this movie was shot almost 12 years ago. You know, it, what, maybe three, four years ago tops. Yeah. And I think that's a, a credit to it. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen this movie before, please log off now if you don't want to be spoiled. We're going to be talking about some serious spoilers going forward. Let's talk a little bit about Derek Mears as Jason. So there have been plenty of actors, stuntmen who have played Jason over the years. There's debates about who's the best, who's the most iconic, who's the most indelible. For me personally, I think that Derek Mears is one of the top Jason performers in the entire series. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, we've got we've got Kane Hodder and Kane Hodder really defined a certain style for Jason for for the earlier films. That was absolutely brilliant what he did as well. But in terms of reconceiving Jason as a tactician and as a hunter, Derek Mears brought another level to that character entirely. I mean, it's I mean, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't occur to you right off the bat of some of the changes that he did that oh well that's not Jason you can't have him run he was running in the final chapter guys it's he was he's more terrifying running sorry he is just the moves that he plays in even wearing the sack head which also can we talk about the design of the sack head as well brilliant, brilliant. so good like 
you will, as much as I love Friday the 13th Part 2, that sackhead gets to be a little comical at certain points. It's kind of a little huge at points. Like the, the, the potato sack with the the eye hole cut out? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, whereas with this one, it kind of looks like a mesh-up between Friday the 13th and Letterface, like where it's tight on his face so that he knows it's not going to come off at any point in time. No. And, ju- and just even just how he composed himself in the stances he takes, it's so terrifying and so great. And we get we get a pretty big bulk of the movie where he's in the ho- where he's in the uh, the sack at, and it's not until maybe about halfway that he gets the hockey mask. And even the hockey mask is freaking fantastic as all hell. But yeah, but in terms of what Derek Mears added to the character of Jason, probably one of the biggest things was uh, watching some of the behind the scenes, and he was talking about how when he got cast as Jason, he said that this was the dream role of a lifetime for him because as a kid he suffered from something called alopecia which basically views hair on your body as an obstacle and when he was a kid his hair started falling out in patches all over the place and you know he was castigated for that you know kid on the schoolyard and stuff like that and then he did say that watching friday the 13th made him feel some type of connection to jason as a kid and he's like oh man, that guy is almost like me. You know, oh, I can relate to that character, at least in some odd way, shape, or form watching those films. It was representation for him to a certain extent. And you see that passion all throughout the entire film. Like, there is not a single moment in this film where he phones it in. He is all there. Yeah. He he hands down is probably one of the best Jasons that we've had in the entire series. It's tough for me. I. I can't choose between Kane Hodder and Derek Mears because both of them are phenomenal in their own sense, but they both work in their own films. If you switch them up with each other's films, they would not work, but they are both perfect for what they're trying to do. I agree. I, I, I it's it, for me personally, Ted White's my favorite Jason uh, from uh, after he's fantastic. Jason, and he brought a level of physicality to the, the role of Jason that we had not seen in previous incarnations. Um, you know, where he really felt like a physical force, like he was like carved out of wood. You know, he was just like, you know, if he wanted to bust through a wall or bust through a door or, you know, reach through a wall to get you, he could and he would. Uh, so that he's my favorite. Um, Derek Mears is my second favorite because, again, he he, he took the, the physicality that Ted White brought to the, the role and he kind of expanded on it, you know, again, with the running, with the... Um, the mobility of Jason in terms of his flexibility, you know, he, he didn't seem like a robot anymore, like kind of like Kane Hodder did. What he brought to the role is so overlooked just because it is a remake. And again, it's a remake of one, two, and three to an extent. I mean, in, in the in the prologue, in the, the opening tiles, we had part one with Pamela Voorhees. Mm-hmm. And then part two is kind of like, you know, the prologue with the sack head. And then eventually, you know, he gets the mask. So that's kind of part three. So it's kind of, again, it's like three movies into one. But again, it's it's a shame that his performance kind of gets dismissed as just, you know, another another Jason that's disrespectful to Jason. Again, we're talking about disrespectful to a mass murder fuck off. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he he's an amazing, amazing Jason. He really, really is. And again, like you said, he, you could tell that he cared about this role. And watching the interviews with him uh, in uh, the publicity tour and the making of, you know, where you could see how much he cared about this character you know, compared to the, all the other characters that he's played in his career. Um, he's a really memorable Jason. He's an amazing Jason. And I hope, even though it's been 11 years going on 12, I hope that as the years go on, I hope that he is more appreciated and that his interpretation of the character gets more recognition and and fanfare. Because he, mm-hmm. he again, it, it, it's easy. I imagine it would be easy for a stuntman or an actor to just kind of phone it in behind a mask and behind a lot of makeup. Derek Mears took it 100% and he ran with it and he tried to make it his own and he did make it his own. He succeeded in making it his own. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, Derek Mears, unbelievable as Jason. Um, So Andres, I want to talk with you about the characters. That's the thing I like to talk about because that's been one of the main criticisms about this movie is how the characters are unlikable. Um, They're not relatable, bad acting. You know, again, we both completely disagree with this. Uh, and I'd like to start, first of all, with uh, Jared Padalecki as Clay, who is uh, searching for his missing sister, uh, Whitney, who is in the prologue, which, by the way, the prologue to this movie is one of the best prologues ever, not just, <laughs> but ever. It's, it was worth the price of admission alone. It's 
brilliant. I mean, it would make a great Friday the 13th short film on its own, frankly. If, if that entire movie was a piece of garbage right afterwards, you know what? We got our money's worth in that first 20 minutes. The, the first 20 minutes was brilliant, brilliant. I mean, and again, we're going to be talking about the kills later on in the episode, so you know, stick with us for that. But in terms of setting up your audience for what was to come, and for kind of just hitting him in the face with a sledgehammer right away, or a machete, if you will, mm-hmm. no pun intended. Um, that it just brilliant, brilliant. And, and again, I, I vividly remember that sitting in the theater and Jason coming forward with the machete about to hit Whitney, smash cut to black, Friday the 13th. <laughs> the audience just blew up and just devoured it. It was so much fun. Uh-huh. Um, but going back to Jared Padalecki, who again, his sister Whitney, uh, disappeared in the beginning and he's searching for her around Camp Crystal Lake you know going around handing, handing out flyers to say that this character is unlikable or unrelatable is just even if people have never lost a loved one or have never you know even for people who maybe don't have you know siblings or whatever the fact that you can't relate with a guy looking for his missing sister especially since their mother had just passed from cancer and his sister was taking care of their mother and to just up and vanish without a trace like that to not empathize with this man's desperation to find his sister and to to feel his hurt and to 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 feel how futile his search has been i mean how can you say that i mean i mean correct i mean am i wrong here do you agree with me Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. I, I think probably Clay is probably the best um, uh, protagonist that we've had in a Friday the 13th film since Tommy Jarvis. I mean, to yes, be completely yes. honest. Yes. 100%. I mean, th- there, there's not been as much depth to a character in a Friday film as as we've seen him in 20 or 30 years of the franchise. I mean, they haven't really delivered us a character that is as relatable as that or something that we can just go, you know what? We want to be on this side all the way through. And even still, like, as you're talking about the futility of him looking for his sister and everybody that that he comes across is very cold, very distant, just going like, yeah, no, she's dead. And just pretend that she's dead because she's most likely dead. Because you get the sense that you get the sense that kids have been disappearing for years upon years because of certain character with a hot, I mean, certain character with a sack face, but that we'll get into that a little later. Yeah. 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 Um, It's funny because when I saw this movie, I empathized with him right away. And and again, I'm an older brother of a younger sister, so I can empathize with that completely. Um, But also in a different way, and I'm going to get very serious here. I'm going to get very dark here, but it it has to be said in in college at Columbia. Uh, I took a uh, psychology class and part of that psychology class was studying uh, various serial killers and one of the serial killers we discussed was John Wayne Gacy who obviously still his cloud hangs very much over Chicago even to this day yeah and uh, one of John Wayne Gacy's victims I remember reading um, a an obituary for uh, one of his victims I'm not going to say the name um, but it was written by the victim's mother, and it was a 19-year-old man who was picked up by John Wayne Gacy and brutally tortured and, and drowned, and, um, and he was one of the, the skeletons they found in his crawl space. And reading the obituary from the point of view of the mother, of the family member, it makes you really look at these killers as less than human. And I had taken this course before seeing this movie. And again, it's just a Friday the 13th movie. It's it's supposed to be fun. It's not, it's just supposed to be a mindless horror movie. But seeing Jared Padalecki going around, posting up flyers, missing sister, missing person, it kind of hit home in that way. Because there's a lot of people that have lost loved ones to serial killers over the years that have done the very same thing, posted missing, you know, missing persons flyers. I thought that added a, a depth to Jared Padalecki's character, Clay. And that made you instantly root for him and instantly take his side and and and, and want to find his sister and, and even and again at the end of the prologue we think whitney is dead i mean he's coming down with that machete and he's about to hack her right in half we think she's dead so we automatically feel sorry for this guy because like dude you're looking for a sister that is long gone by this point and, he, and yeah. again like you said it the cops are telling him, like dude she's long gone like it's it's been you know weeks months she's gone mm-hmm. let it go you know, just start the process of grieving like the other family members have. So, again, for those of you out there who are watching this and said that the characters are not relatable, 
or you don't have any empathy for with characters in this movie, shame on you. Because this is, again, like you said, the most complex male character we've had since Tommy Jarvis in the original movies. Um, I also want to talk with you about Daniel Panabaker's character, Jenna. Absolutely. Very sympathetic character, very empathetic, very likable. Uh, because she's dating that douchebag Trent, played by Travis Van Winkle. Uh, <laughs> Give me your impressions of her performance, because she's fantastic in this movie. She's fantastic in all, most of the horror movies she does, but specifically this movie. What is it about her that made her likable for you? Instantly, the scene that made me like her was the scene where she meets Clay at the gas station with her friends. And Clay is there, and he's trying to be respectful, and he's trying to post up a flyer or just even something in the gas station. Even though she's with her friends and she's with her douchebag boyfriend, and he's uh, he's simultaneously one of the biggest pieces of shit in the movie, but he's also one of my favorite characters. And but we'll get into that later. <laughs> but um, but the thing is with Danielle, she automatically rejects that side of her friends, and she automatically starts to empathize with Clay, and that just also gets you to instantly like her as well, too. And I couldn't agree with you more about Daniel Panabaker's performance. I mean, again, she is, she's endearing, she's likable, and she's almost kind of like the audience's vessel in a way. And to see how genuinely she, she wants to help him. You know, she kind of feels pulled initially between her friends and her boyfriend or helping this guy out, you know, and then eventually she does go with him off into the woods to help him look for clues and, you know, for things of that nature. Um, if Jared Padalecki is like the brains of the movie, if his character is the brains of the movie, then she's easily the heart and soul of the movie. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, she is a credit to this movie and she's a reason you watch this movie, especially when you see what her boyfriend Trent ends up doing later on in the movie, piece of shit that he is, but again, piece of shit that both you and I find hilarious. Uh, and I also want to talk about uh, Chewie and Lawrence, uh, the comic relief of the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, you always have these characters in the Friday the 13th movies and most slashers, you have these characters where, you know, they're, they're, their sole function is to get mocked for not getting laid and to smoke weed or get drunk and then eventually die a horrible death. Um, and obviously both these guys do it to a T. But what makes these guys so special and what makes them so, you know, likable is the fact that they have each other's backs. You know what I mean? Like they, they realize that neither of them is going to get laid, even though they desperately want to. Uh, they realize that they're, you know, kind of like the bottom rung of the group. You know, they're not, you know, they're not in with the ladies. You know, they don't have a girlfriend that they're bringing with them. You know, they're kind of like the nerds of the group. And again, it makes them more endearing, especially when one of the characters, we'll, we're talking about this later when we're talking about the kills, one of the characters ends up suffering a really, really gruesome death. And then the other character goes out to try to save him. And of course, it doesn't, doesn't pan out for him. Um, but those two guys, being the comic relief, they are another credit to the movie. Because not only are they funny, there's a lot of characters in the Friday the 13th series that are funny, but they're not necessarily likable or mm -hmm. relatable. Uh, these guys are likable and they are relatable. And when they die, you care. And I remember at our screening that when both of them died, you could kind of feel the air kind of come out of the audience a little bit because you're like, well, kind of had a feeling they were going to die. I didn't think they were gonna die in that way. That was that's kind of like, oh man, that's brutal. That's that's rough. Like it, it didn't even have a chance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let me ask you about you know Chewy and Lawrence. Uh, did you feel the same way? Like, did you think they were? I mean, again, potheads. That you know they're fucking hilarious. You know the whole beer pong scene with Chewy, where you know he, he takes <laughs> and goes, shoot the boo, shoot the boo. <laughs> he comes over, and drinks the beer out of the shoe, and there's that is disgusting. <laughs> Did you feel the so same way? Just, oh, absolutely, dude. Like, those two are freaking hilarious. And I love the back and forth between them. And also just their repertoire with, with the other teenagers at the campsite as well, too. Because, you know, they, they do play into that nerd aspect. And also on top of that, I think probably the biggest thing about these two characters as well, too, is that they're both played by minorities. And that's fantastic. And we don't get a lot of we don't get a lot of diversity in terms of these films. Not a lot. Like even with the opening scene, I mean, it's all particularly, you know, just, you know, just a group of white kids going into the forest. That's fine. But I think with Chewie and Lawrence, 
their sort of dynamic brings a freshness to the series. And it also brings a freshness to the group. And in terms of just how they interact with the other kids, it's so funny where all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, Lawrence just comes out and says uh, to, um, to the, uh, to the other girl in, in the group, just like, Oh, well, um, you know, I'm a music producer. And she goes, Oh, well, what do you produce rap? And he's like, why 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 because i'm black i'm i'm automatically the rapper and she's like oh i'm sorry i'm sorry what are you like producing? Day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then all of a sudden he walks off he's like i produce rap <laughs> it's like yeah no if you were if you were in that same position you would milk those type of moments all for all they're worth and i love the fact that also chewy is an engineer as well too so on top of that not all these kids are fucking stupid and that's also the other thing too that you mentioned when um, one of the one of the one of the two guys actually goes out and tries to help the other. It doesn't come from a place of like, oh my god, don't do it. It's like, no, you get why. You get why he's going out there. You get why he's sticking his neck out for his best friend. Hey, that's my boy out there. I'm gonna go get him. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it, it, it's it's you you love to hear it and it, and you love to see it because I mean, again, so many times you know characters in movies, you know, they get into deep shit. They you know they're used as bait, and other characters just you know hide and they just let them die. But Lawrence is like, no, fuck you. Like, like, oh, don't go out there. No, that's my boy out there. I'm going to go get him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, again, it's just, you know, it's one of those things where it just, it makes you root for these characters more. You want to see them survive. You, you know, again, there's been plenty of Friday the 13th movies in the past where you're just like counting the minutes when someone gets their head chopped off or, you know, they get burned alive or whatever the case may be. Not with these characters, not for me, man. I mean, like, I, I wanted to see them live. I didn't want to see them go out that way. I, like, I was kind of dreading the fact that they were going to die. Yeah. And they, that is a credit to this movie. You shouldn't be looking forward to seeing these characters get killed. When they get killed, you should feel it and you should care. And again, with this remake, you do. You do. Mm-hmm. And that's just the way I feel about it. Uh, let's talk about Trent. <laughs> let's talk about Trent briefly here because, again, it's... <laughs> He's a credit to the movie, even though he's a douchebag. He's fucking funny. He's funny. Like again, you don't like the guy, but he, I mean, like, you can't help but laugh at him. It's just, it's great. I mean, even when okay, you mentioned earlier when they were at the convenience store, and Clay is like, "Hey, is it okay if I like if I put my you know my sister's picture up here in the walls?" And, and then and Trent, hey man, are you gonna like like hurry up and like buy something? Because like you know you're just you're doing an awful lot of chatting up here. I'm just you know wondering. <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead, man. Go ahead. Sorry about that. He goes uh, and Trent starts paying for stuff, and you know, then uh, Clay. I forget what he says. He says something to the fact like, "Yeah, I don't want to like take up too much of your time or whatever like that." And then, then Trent, you okay, bro? You okay? We got a problem here. Hey, Trent, just leave him alone. What? No, I'm not gonna leave him alone. This guy's being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, "Yeah, it's obviously me that's the one's being a dick." <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's fucking funny. I mean, he's a douchebag, but it's funny. I mean, like Travis Van Winkle, again, you know, and we're going to talk about this briefly. We might as well talk about it now. If he's the same character from Transformers who's dating Megan Fox and got dumped by Megan Fox, now he ended up with Daniel Panabaker and gets killed by Jason. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> I'm all up for that. <laughs> treated Shia LaBeouf like a douche, and now he's treating Jared Padalecki like a douche. He's got what he's getting what's coming to him. <laughs> um, and again, there's the infamous sex scene oh. later in the movie that was apparently so cringy and so explicit that Michael Bay himself at the premiere got up and he left because he was so uncomfortable. <laughs> and again, we've had plenty of sex in Friday the 13th movies in the past. We really have. Nothing to this degree. Nothing like this. Like this. Again, softcore porn. I don't know how this how this got an R rating. This belongs on Pornhub, dude. I mean, it was real. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty gnarly. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I, I'm surprised that they didn't just go out and try to get Daphne Rosen for this scene. <laughs> uh, but anyway, go ahead and talk to me about Trent because I mean, I know we both feel the same way. Why is it that he can be such a douche and yet he's still funny? And you know, I know that everybody clapped when he died in our screening, but again, yeah. but again it's like you, you didn't want to see him die because you wanted the laughs to keep on coming. What you, what is it about Trent that makes us? laugh at him despite him being a total asshole 
Trent, I feel, is the character that we expect all these kids to be in a Friday the 13th movie. He doesn't stick up for his friends. He starts making wrong choices every single step of the way. He's also a douchebag to all his best friends out there. And it's also one of those things, too, where it's like, oh, it's his parents' cabin. But um, he, he's constantly cleaning up after people. He's constantly going, hey, 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 would you mind just not putting your feet on the rug right there? It's like real denim, all right? It's like, oh, my God, this guy's a douchebag. Like, we're, we're kind of waiting for him to get killed. But at the same time, he keeps giving us reasons why we need to watch this movie because he's so goddamn awful at points. I mean, just just even the scene where he goes off and hooks up with one of the other chicks at the, at the party, the line that he has as soon as he finishes got a massive laugh in our audience. Come on, your tits are stupendous. Who talks like that? Also... Who- your tits are just so, just so fucking juicy, man. <laughs> I mean, and there's also the scene, like, I don't know why this always cracks me up, but like, it just shows you like what a, like a, a, a elitist asshole that he is. When Chewie has the shot of whatever he's drinking, I, I think it's like wild turkey or Jameson, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he's like, hey, Hey, here, let's just all be one fucking happy cliche, whatever. And then, try, dude, what the fuck? Do not burn my parents' house as he let his shot on fire. Do not burn my, mom, my fucking parents' house down, you asshole. I mean, again, he is, it's very rare when you can have an asshole in a slasher movie and kind of be bummed when he dies. Kind kind of be bummed, but also at the same time, he had it fucking coming. He, he coming. ran he ran off on the girl that he just had sex with, and he clearly saw that there was danger. He also shot. He also shot at her as well too, and he didn't know that she was already dead. And he yeah. tried to play it off like he like like it never happened. Like you're just like, oh my god, this fucking piece of human garbage. That is punctuated perfectly when the body lands in front of him and he starts screaming like a bitch. It's so great. Again, one of those moments where the audience absolutely lost it when he gave it, ah! when he had that like horrible, like high pitched scream, when he used <laughs> uh, the girl's body right in front of him. Ah! And it was, it was, again, it was one of those moments where like the whole audience, usually when it comes to laughs and horror movies, you might hear like one or two, laughs you know people don't know if they think it's funny you might hear a majority of them laugh but not the whole theater the whole theater lost their shit when he gave that scream <laughs> yep and when he dies again you hear the audience clapping he's like thank god fuck that guy enough is enough. <laughs> he served his purpose but god, he's enough is enough <laughs> we're ready to see him go by this point we're, we're his- ready to see him just go like just it, it, just take him away um, yeah. <laughs> so we've given you our characters that we love and characters that we think are incredibly relatable and likable way more so than any other characters in any Friday the 13th movie I want to get to why we watch these movies which is the kills we have plenty of great kills in this movie if you were to listen to haters if you were to listen to detractors of this movie you would think that this movie doesn't have any signature kills. This movie is tame in comparison. It's not imaginative. It's not creative enough. Bullshit. This movie has fantastic kills and, and memorable kills and kills where you see it and you're like, damn, that looks like it fucking hurts. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Do you agree that this movie has some of the best kills in the series? Oh, absolutely. I agree. That has probably not even some of the best kills in the series, but also some of the more inventive kills. Yes. And it's not an inventive in the way that we, even how they redo Jason, they reconfigure Jason to a certain extent makes total sense for the kills. And it also gives you a kind of grittiness to some of these kills. Like, I mean, one of my favorite deaths is um, uh, Whitney's boyfriend's death in the Jason house where all of a sudden, you know, they're standing on on a freaking wooden floor and then all of a sudden the machete keeps going through and keeps going through and you really don't see that much of Jason in the scene at all. You start to get a sense of dread and you're just like, holy crap, what are they going to fucking do by this point? And then what sealed the deal for me was seeing the girl tied up in the sleeping bag above the fire. That I was like, 
Wow, they they they're they're really taking these kills up to a next level like this. Brutal. He ties up the woman in the sleeping bag and hangs her over the the fire pit. And in the killer cut, it's even ex it's it's longer. You see her skin starting to peel away from the the flames and the heat, and like you know, she's just screaming. And you know she's zipped up in there, and like you see this, the 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 smoke and like her flesh is burning, and she's just like screaming at a high pitch. She's like, "Someone help me, Richie! Richie, help me! Help me! Help me!" Like, and then she just falls out of the bag, and you just see her skin completely burned. Mm -hmm. If that's not brutal, if that's not creative, I don't know what the fuck is. Like, I mean, I, again, that is that's one of those kills where when you see it. You're like, oh my God, what a terrible way to go. You're fucking suffocating from the smoke and you're burning alive. Yeah. That's fucking gnarly. That's bad. Um, and then also one of my, um, it's not necessarily a favorite kill of mine in terms of the series, but it's certainly one of the most memorable because again, we were talking about these characters. When Chewie is killed by having the screwdriver slowly punctured through his esophagus uh, and you hear him choking on his own blood and he's struggling as best he can to prevent Jason from fucking sinking that thing into his neck. And you just see, like, you have the extreme close-up of the, the the screwdriver going into his neck. You see the blood start to shoot out, and the blood starts coming out of his mouth. He's like, <coughs> and he, like, he can't breathe. He's gurgling on his own blood. I mean, come on, that's horrific. That's that's terrible, and it's happening to a very likable character. And also the other thing too that we've not seen in a particular Friday film going on to this point is the acting in the kills. I mean, I, I, I've seen some of the behind the scenes stuff for this film where the actor who played Chewie, like apparently when the actor who played Jason, Derek Mears, was was um, was doing the kill with him. He apparently thought that he had actually started, like you know, started puncturing his neck, and actually thought, "Oh my God, something's happened. This is clearly not going right." Um, he's bleeding out through his nose and all this other stuff. And apparently, the actor just went, "Oh no, 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 it's all good, man." Like honestly, what I did was I I I put the blood in my mouth and I inhaled it so that it would come out through my nostrils. It's like. Fuck! That's a level of commitment that you want from a from a Friday film, dude. That, that sounds painful. And also, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Aaron Yu, who plays Chewie, he had just had surgery to remove his appendix. Yeah. So when Lawrence goes into the the shed and he finds him and he and he's hanging from the rafters and he droops down and he sees him just dangling there. Marcus Dispel was actually pretty nervous because he wanted to film that shit real quick. He's like, dude, he just got over appendix surgery and he's still got the stitches in there. We don't want him dangling there for too long because God forbid those stitches open up. You don't want his freaking you know, guts to spill out all over the set. Uh, <laughs> so that shows his dedication as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it was just, I mean, dedication on Aaron Yu's part and also an incredibly brutal, just brutal, brutal death that really sticks out in my mind. Um, you can also talk about the the arrow through the head, you know, on the lake scene uh, with the, the the infamous topless uh, water skiing. Scene. <laughs> uh, but I want to talk about Willa Ford's death too, when she's hiding underneath the dock. Oh yeah, and she's and she you know the boat hits her in the head, and she's got that you know the contusion on her head. She's bleeding like crazy, um, and she's hiding under the dock from Jason. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, the beautiful you know Daniel Pearl shots with you know Jason. You can see Jason through the slats in the dock and you see him kind of looking over at the water, you know, and you hear the footsteps on the pier and she's just kind of like, you know, not trying to breathe. You know? And then the, the machete comes right down through the dock, right into her head, pulls her up out of the water so you can see her boobs one more time. <laughs> and the blood starts pouring out of her wound in the head and dripping all over her boobs. And then she drops down from the machete and she drops back down in the water. Again, as well as things where the audience just couldn't help but laugh. It's like, God damn, this is so fucking gratuitous. It's gratuitous, <laughs> but it knows what it wants to be, dude. No, exactly. It knows <laughs> what it wants to be. And this is something that you would see in Friday the 13th, part three. You know, it, it, again, it was a vintage kill that it was shamelessly gratuitous and shamelessly <laughs> graphic. And it was funny. It was, it, 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 again, it's... You don't walk into these movies, you know, thinking that you're going to see John Doe doing his work on Sinners in Seven, okay? Like, th th no. th this is a different, you know, you're supposed to laugh. And if you don't think it's funny, if you're not, you know, if that's not your cup of tea, then don't watch the fucking movie. It was a <laughs> funny scene. I mean, again, you can be offended, but, oh my God, I can't believe they showed her boobs and the blood. Stop it. it. It was funny. It was memorable. It was a great kill. And it's one of the best kills of Friday the 13th, as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and again, I mean, there's some other good kills in the in the in the movie, but 
you know, you talk about the fire poker going through the cop's eye through the door, you know, when the fire poker, the fire stick comes out through the other end of the door. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was great. Um, but again, for me, those are my top three favorite kills. It's the sleeping bag kill, Chewie's kill, and the machete through the head underneath the pier. Mm -hmm. Because, I, I, again, I, I didn't expect the brutality for most of them. Because again, I mean, Friday the 13th movies in the past, I mean, you pick any one of them, you can say any one of them's brutal, but they're also over the top. And they're also kind of tongue in cheek in a way, outside of maybe the original. Mm -hmm. The sleeping bag kill and Chewie's kill are not over the top per se. They're just straight up brutal. They're just straight up nasty. Yeah. And again, Willa Ford's death, uh, it's over the top. But I mean, again, it's memorable. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it, I don't even want to say it's enjoyable because I want to sound like a psycho. But but again, it's it's one of the more identifiable kills in the Friday the 13th series. Do you have any that you want to talk about? Do you have any that stick out of your mind outside of the ones I just talked about? Oh, yeah, absolutely, dude. I mean, the... Um... Of course, the sleeping bag kill is definitely my favorite one out of the bunch. But the one that I feel doesn't get talked about enough is actually Lawrence's death, because it's not a one and done thing. It actually goes on for quite a bit longer than it rightfully should. So he goes into the shed to try to save his friend Chewie. And then immediately when he starts facing off against Jason, he gets that one little moment that us as the audience are like, yeah, fuck yeah. Like when all of a sudden he's fighting Jason and then Jason's about to come and grab him and stab him. And he goes, not today, fucker. And then he just runs right off. And then it just builds up in a moment of tension. The minute you see the ax pop up and the sound effect of the ax flying through the air and landing into his spine is it's so brutal, dude. Like you're saying, again, a lot of these kills are freaking brutal. And then also on top of that, he's out there and he's begging for somebody to help him because they're probably within maybe a couple of steps of him. And he's yelling for someone to come out and save him. And Clay automatically knows, no, don't go out there. He's using your friend as bait. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of horrific. That's terrifying. And ultimately, you know, his kill is pretty fast, but it, but for the prolonged nature of it, that's brutal. And, and it also leads to probably one of my favorite shots in the entire film when, you know, you just see the close up of Jared Padlecki and Danielle, and then you just kind of go, wait, man, is he really using them as bait? And then all of a sudden the camera pans up and there's Jason standing in the moon with the freaking machete. You're just like, that is freaking terrifying we've not seen jason this scary in years and it's absolutely killing it a hundred a hundred percent again i couldn't agree with you more as a matter of fact uh back in the day but when this movie was in production i remember reading a set visit i can't remember what website it was but they talked about specifically when they were filming that scene where they were using uh lawrence as uh bait to you know lure the remaining characters out to kind of help him and we're talking about how Marcus Nispel was kind of framing the shot with Daniel Pearl and how, you know, the camera kind of pans up and you see Jason standing there beautifully lit with the machete just staring down at them, waiting for them to come out. You see Hunter Jason. You know, you see him in like a very like, it's, he's not just a mindless killing machine that just happens to be in the right spot at the right time. He's, th he's not, you know, he's not mentally handicapped like the movies have made him out to be, you know, like despite him being physically deformed, that's not this Jason, he's very smart. You know, he's, he's survived off the land. These people are intruding on his land, and he is very much the hunter in the situation. Just like hunters might use wounded animals to lure out, you know, you know, bears or lions or whatever the case may be, he's doing the exact same thing. And again, it added dimension to Jason that we never got before. Yeah, uh, seeing you know, Jason as a tactician, it's genius. Absolutely yeah. genius. He's play, he, you know, while they're playing checkers, he's playing chess. And again, it, it just, again, it just it, it it adds a level of complexity to Jason's character that we never had before. Um, so that just elevates this movie even more in my eyes. That you know we never got this aspect of Jason before in any of the movies. Yeah, I mean it's just, it's it's and again, Miss Spell says like we wanted to keep the extravagant nature of the kills intact, but we also wanted to provide a level of realism to it. We didn't want it to be too over the top or too laughable. Outside of maybe a few kills here and there, the kind yeah. of. Nostalgic, you know, but for the most of them, we wanted you guys to really feel the impact of these kills and to feel the pain that these characters were going through to add the, the character's death some weight. And it yeah. worked. It, 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 you do, we're talking about right now. That's exactly what happened. It was a success as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And uh, just a real quick talk about two other kills as well, too. Trent's death. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely freaking played to a T. Incredible. There's that moment where he's running out into the woods. He's lost by himself and a car passes by him and us, the audience, we're not sure if that's Jason driving the car. The minute the hand comes out and just goes, come on down. You're just like, oh, fuck, is it or is it not? And then you see that it's not Jason, but there's Jason. And then he flat out impales him. But the hilarity of the driver realizing what's going on and speeding off. But he doesn't realize that he's speeding off with Trent's impaled corpse right behind his car. And the shot of Trent is like, <laughs> it's so freaking hysterical. That's probably the one that's played more for the laughs more than anything else. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because again, the audience is ready to see him go by that point. <laughs> but also another kill that co- completely caught me by surprise is Daniel Pennebacher's, uh death as well. I mean, you go through the entire movie and she's doing everything that the final girl in every other Friday film has done but she still doesn't get out of it. Yeah. It really went a long way to going that no matter what you do and no matter how how over the top the situation is, there's still some stakes to this and anybody could go. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, that's one of the more shocking deaths for me personally in any uh, horror movie ever for the simple fact that again, I didn't, I, I didn't think they were gonna kill her. No. I thought she was going to escape with uh, with Clay and Whitney. Um, again, it's one of those deaths where when she dies, you're you're shocked, you're stunned, and it hurts. You want her to make it through. And, and again, it, it kind of, it makes the audience hate Jason all the more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you want him to somehow either die or get seriously fucked up and hurt in, in some way. Because, again, you want to kill all these other characters, we kind of knew that that was coming. We expected it. This is a Friday the 13th movie after all. Jenna's death is like, oh, damn. Did they really just do that? Damn. And, and in such a way that she was almost home free too. She's coming out of the hole and the machete goes right through her. And it's like, ah, I mean, it's, 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 it's in, in many ways, it's like many, many of the deaths that I experienced firsthand when we were play, playing Friday the 13th. Again. No, yeah. <laughs> By yours you're, truly. You're home free, but you're not. <laughs> um, and that's what that really reminded me of. And again, kudos to Daniel Panabaker for, for a, a wonderful character and for making us care about her when she died. Um, because uh, again, that was kind of a downer too when she when she bit the bullet. And again, not many Friday the 13th movies have that that moment where you really do care about the character's death. But again, when Chewie dies, when Lawrence dies, and when Jenna dies, you care. And that mm-hmm. is a testament to the movie and to the screenplay and for the actors, you know, making them likable and for being well cast. Absolutely. Um, so there you have it. We've talked about the reasons we think this is an underrated slasher movie, horror movie, underrated remake, whatever you want to call it. This movie deserves way more credit and way more respect than it's gotten. Again, hopefully in the uh, coming years, more fans will come around to it like you and I have. I mean, we've appreciated it since the moment we saw it. Again, it's one of those movies where I put it on every October to appreciate, just like all the other Friday the 13th movies I love. Part two, final chapter, Jason Lives, et cetera, and so forth. It's it's just as good as those movies, if not better, quite frankly, from a production standpoint. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and actually, Andres, uh, publicly, I want to thank you right here <laughs> for this very wonderful Friday the 13th, 2009, Jason Necca. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're thank very you. welcome. Yeah, no, I mean, Necca always does quality work, and this is no different, so thank you very much for this. Oh, dude, it's one of their best figures. I have mine standing right here with the sack head in all glory right now. Uh, do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to talk about? I think we've talked about this movie and why it deserves a lot more respect and why it's completely underrated. But do you have any parting thoughts you want to talk about? Anything you want to tell our audience here about the movie? If you're not sure whether or not you want to get into the Jason franchise, this film for me is what I consider to be the love letter to the franchise. It's everything that worked well about the first couple of movies. It's everything that we love about Jason in one film. And it's also what we love about horror in general on one film. It's got TNA, it's got blood, it's got gore, it's got the laughs, it's got the scares, it's got the beautiful cinematography, the production value of great Jason, relatable characters. This is a fantastic Friday the 13th movie. And 
I can't recommend this movie enough. If you can get your hands on this movie, please do the killer cut, especially if you can. If you can get your hands on the killer cut, by all means do so. That is the definitive cut of the movie. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say this. In terms of the Platinum Dunes remakes, in terms of, in terms of the two remakes that Marcus Nispel did, mm-hmm. I prefer his remake of Friday the 13th to the original. But in terms of being a definitive Friday the 13th movie, in terms of it embracing everything that I think of when I think of a Friday the 13th movie, this remake does it and then some. And that's Absolutely. why I prefer it to the original. It does a it does a much better job of being a Friday the 13th movie than the original. I know it's going to be blasphemous. I know that's going to be, I know I probably will get a couple thumbs down from people for this, for <laughs> saying that, in which case, get out of here. Uh, so, uh, so that'll do us for us here today. Again, joined by Andres Gallego. Thanks again so much, buddy, for joining me today for this one. Absolutely, dude. I've been wanting to talk about this one for a while, and I know we both love this movie. With, with just all of our hearts, we love this. We do, we do. And again, and uh, and the edit also again done by Andres Gallego. If you love the video, my man's work right here. Uh, I'm Steve Cravens, I'm your host for the Under Eight series. Go ahead and check out some of the other reviews we've done in the past. We just did one for Cape Fear and also for Batman Returns. This has been the Under Eight series. Thank you for watching. And we're going to leave you with our uh, final scene from the movie that we both really enjoy. And until next time, thank you for watching. Take care. Help me! Help me! Please help me! Lawrence! No, 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 you can't go out there. We have to help him. No, we can't, okay? He's using your friend as bait. He wants us to go out there. Well, you don't know that.